So it is, uh, as, as we mentioned, it is Palm Sunday week, and we go from the scripture lesson today, uh, if you were to do the actual Palm Sunday text, which many of you know, uh, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, there were people that gathered, and depending on the gospel you read, some laid cl- their cloaks down, others waving palm branches. Uh, one text doesn't include either of those, and they are shouting, Hosanna, uh, Hosanna, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And, and as we look at that text and, and uh, that people were cheering and they were ready for the fervor of, of announcing and crowning a king, someone that would come and overthrow Rome, someone that would overthrow the emperor, someone that would reestablish uh, the glory of, of Israel. And, and then we go, if you read through the entire text, we see uh, by the end of this week, by Friday, just five days later, there is another crowd, uh, one ready to crown him king, One on Friday morning, gathering, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And so we want to look at one of the texts in between those days and looking at the encounter that Jesus has with Pilate, or maybe better yet, that Pilate has with Jesus, and the decision that Pilate has to make. And the decision that Pilate has to make, the choice that he has, is whether to accept truth or to walk away. His choice is to accept truth or to walk away. Now, have you ever had the experience of believing something so, so deeply and wholeheartedly only to have to realize that what you believed was not true somewhere later down the road? It can be a devastating thing uh, to believe something so deeply and so wholeheartedly and to find out down the road that you were either wrong or misinformed or whatever it may be. When I was in, when I was in middle school, uh, I believed deeply with my whole heart that Michael Jordan was not the greatest basketball player of his generation. Now, everyone around me had Michael Jordan jerseys, Michael Jordan shirts. Uh, They had Air Jordan kicks on uh, everywhere. It was Michael Jordan this, Michael Jordan that. When people played basketball on my middle school basketball team and high school team, they wagged their tongue like Michael Jordan. We were all a bunch of white guys, but we still wagged our tongue anyway. Uh, and, And all this, it was Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan. I, on the other hand, preferred David Robinson. Uh, yeah, don't know why. He was from San Antonio, Naval Academy. That was, but I refused to acknowledge Jordan's greatness until I got to be like in college and a young adult. And then I would go back and you see the games and highlights and be like, what was I thinking? Like I had this pride about me that refused to allow me to say the greatness of Michael Jordan. And so, uh, you know, that, that, that that's, has sort of changed over time. Now, on a more serious level, on a more serious level, well, growing up in the community I've grown up in, and I've shared it before, I grew up in a rural farming, a rural poor farming community uh, and where there was no diversity whatsoever. Uh, it was uh, no, diverse, no diversity. We were all white. Uh, our school was predominantly white uh, other than literally like five kids. And, and so growing up, you learned about other cultures through uh, and, and other experiences through your parents and through other people, oftentimes not maliciously, just ignorantly. And so that you are shaped and formed in a certain way that by the time I got to, to college in a more diverse area, although not in, in entirely diverse, uh, by the time I met Andrea, and she's like telling me her experiences in Jersey of all places, uh, you know, uh, and, and by the time I went to co- seminary, grad school in Philadelphia, uh, in, where we met about as close to center city Philadelphia as you could get, uh, my mind was changed on so many things to hear about people's encounters that uh, in Little Shakelyville of 200 people, it was a lot like, actually Magnolia is big compared to the town I grew up in. Andrea will tell you that. My town doesn't even have a restaurant, uh, you know, or a stoplight. So, I mean, this is high city living here in Magnolia compared to where I grew up in. Andrea came out to visit and she's like, this is it? We do have the Twin Kiss, so if, if you ever come to Shakelyville, you have to go to the Twin Kiss. But, uh, you know, but growing up in that area, like, I believed a lot of things about a lot of different people because of, and, and oftentimes it was the ignorance of it. And I could go through, and I won't go through it today, just some of the things that, that I've had to, that I've changed my mind on, uh, that I've come around to see differently, that I've had to embrace truth in a different way because my lack of experience or the, the negative experiences I had of the way I grew up, uh, it, it, it's challenged me, it's changed me. And so I've had to look and embrace truth and embrace other people differently. And, and sometimes it's led to having to repent about that as well uh, for the attitudes that I've had and the beliefs that I instilled, sometimes embedded deep within me that I didn't even realize were there until someone's like, uh, Steve, you need, to, you need to check that a little bit. Well, in John 18, uh, as we said, I think we're gonna look at what Pilate has in this idea of his opportunity 
to embrace truth. And let's, let's talk through the passage real quick and what's happening here uh, because there is this interaction between two different cultures. There's this interaction between two different uh, belief systems here. So in John 18, Jesus is arrested by a detachment of Roman troops and Jewish officials. And uh, he was brought before Annas, the former high priest, and Caiaphas, who was his son-in-law, who was the current high priest. And the Jewish leaders took Jesus to the palace of the Roman governor, a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. Now, from biblical and extra-biblical sources, historians know Pilate uh, as someone who lacked a lot of morals. He was, he was brutal. Uh, he was someone who uh, vacillated on positions depending on what benefited him the most, uh, which you know, sounds like a complete politician when you think of it that way. Uh, but Pilate would often hide his flaws through his stubbornness and his brutality. And if you were someone, especially a Jew, who opposed the rule of Pilate, as happened through much of the Roman Empire, uh, Pilate would come and execute you. And there was a brutality uh, that was practiced in and around Jerusalem and Judea while Pilate was governor. And when the Jewish leaders appeared before Pilate, uh, they would not enter his residence. It was coming up on the Passover uh, depending on what, uh, how strict of a Jew you were and how conservative of a Jew you were, you would not even go into the house of a Gentile for fear of being unclean. And so as they came to uh, Pilate's palace or where he was staying, his residence in Jerusalem, uh, the scripture says that they stayed outside. They wouldn't go inside. It was Passover uh, just later that night. They wanted to make sure they would be able to eat the Passover meal and share in the Passover fellowship and, and all the festivities that were going on. And so they would not go inside. And so Pilate came out to them and says to them, what, what charges are you bringing against this man? Which is a bit of irony there because previously the scriptures say that there was Roman soldiers sent out to arrest Jesus. So Pilate has some idea that something is up with this man and certainly probably heard of Jesus as well. And so Pilate likely knew what the leaders were up to, but, but Pilate had a severe dislike for the Jews. Uh, and and some, some writers and historians of the time uh, say that Pilate definitely... Uh, you know, had an anti-Semitic uh, belief. Jewish leaders made it clear that they wanted to execute, they wanted to execute Jesus. And, and at that time in Jerusalem, only Roman officials could practice and carry out an execution. Uh, and, and even though the Jews had, uh, had some autonomy to practice their religion and their customs, which did allow for uh, uh, the death penalty, depending on certain situations, uh, during this time, uh, it was only permitted through uh, the order of the Roman governor. And so Pilate makes them jump through all sorts of hoops, asks them all sorts of questions, send Jesus back out, they come back, uh, and he becomes weary of the situation, wondering why would the Jews be pushing things through. Remember, if you read the story, it says that this happened overnight. This goes from Thursday night into Friday morning. And, and so they're bringing Jesus at like three in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning, depending on uh, how you read the, t the text and the time in there and trying to push Jesus through with little or no trial to get Pilate to issue an execution order. And so uh, Pilate is a little, little weary. And the last straw for Pilate in many ways was that the Jewish people sought the release of an insurrectionist named Barabbas while instead of freeing Jesus and, and shouting, crucify him uh, to Pilate. And remember, Pilate vacillates. He wants to do whatever's best for him. And his fear is, is that if he releases Jesus and the people riot, that Rome will come down on him and, and he will face punishment uh, if things get out of hand. So don't let this get by you this morning that as, as we hear this, and, and this isn't the main point, but I think it's an important point of the story, that the Jewish leaders were more concerned about remaining ceremonially clean to celebrate the Passover than uh, and, and they were manipulating an entire legal system to execute the true Passover lamb. They, had, they, 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 had, they were following, in essence, the letter of the law while missing the heart or the intent of the law. And the Passover lamb, uh, the one that, G, that God had sent to, to forgive the world of our sins, was right before them, and they were intent. And, of course, they were used by God for that. Uh, so back to Pilate and Jesus. Uh, Pilate and Jesus talked and, and had this conversation and this interaction, and, and Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And, Pilate, and Jesus, like a good rabbi, answers with another question. Uh, is that what you have said? Have you come to that by your own conclusion, or has someone been talking about me? And 
Jesus uh, and, and, and Pilate replies again, uh, and Jesus replies, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate says, you are a king then. And Jesus says, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. To which Pilate replied, what is truth? Comedian Stephen Colbert, a couple years ago, coined the word truthiness. Do you guys remember him uh, doing, doing truthiness on the Colbert show? And, and the word went on to become the 2006 word of the year by uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And, and the term, uh, and the word of the word, the award of the word of the year acknowledges that the concept of truth uh, has been disappearing in our culture for many years. And the decay of truth or the death of truth has been escalating in, in the ways in which we engage or the, in the importance of our words and how we communicate what we say and how we're willing to accept things that are not true as, as truth. And certainly uh, in, in over the last several years in our political system, we hear things on either side of the party of fake news. We hear of terms like alternative facts. Uh, Rudy Giuliani claimed at one point that truth is not truth. Time Magazine in 2017 asked the question on the cover uh, of their magazine asking, is truth dead? And on social media, many of us struggle to distinguish posts that are true, uh, that are not true. Uh, some of us perpetuate untrue posts by hitting that nice little share button uh, without ever doing the research. And so we post things like a picture of Abraham Lincoln that says, uh, I heard it on the internet, so it must be true, quote by Abraham Lincoln, you know, uh, as if Abraham Lincoln knows something about the internet. You know, we, we will quickly, because of our own preconceived notions and ideas of what we would like to think is true or what may be true, uh, we will share those things and we end up sharing things that are not true. Part of the confusion around uh, the 2016 politics and what's happened is, did the Russians hack our, you know, did they influence the, the election? Did they uh, influence Facebook and other social media? And, and for, for those of us that sit here, uh, you know, we read those things and, and they influence us. And the challenge then is, how do we distinguish truth in those moments? How important is truth? And as Christians for us, truth is central to who we are and who we're called to be. In a world where truth is seen as relative or where we talk about things like my truth and your truth, uh, we have to be sure that we know the truth uh, through God. Biblically, truth is more than an intellectual concept. The Bible encourages us, encourages us to look at truth in a couple ways, and I want to share the, those ways today. One is that God is the God of truth, that God is the God of truth. And, and the psalmist writes, it says, into your hands I commit my spirit, deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Uh, that's the NIV. If you have the New King James Version and you look at it or the King James Version, that word faithful is translated as truth. And when you look at the Hebrew word for that, it, it can hold either one of those uh, meanings in there. But the idea that when we follow God, that God is the God of truth, that th and there is no falsehood in God. Truth is not truthful or faithful is not just something that God does. It is who God is, okay? Being truthful is not just something that God does, but it is who God is. It is his nature. It is God's nature to be truthful, to be true. And so when we put our faith in God, when we put our faith in, in Yahweh, the God of the Bible, we are putting our faith in the God who is true, who is faithful in all situations. And so truth then becomes vitally important for us. Uh, and so we can put our entire trust in God because God is faithful and true. Secondly, is that Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Since God is the God of truth, and Jesus is God as flesh, then Jesus is the truth. And John writes in a few chapters back from where we are today, Jesus' word in John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the way to God because he is the truth of God. And so if God is the God of truth, we see that truth most clearly when we see Jesus. But think about this in a couple ways. Uh, when, when Moses, if you remember in, in the story of the Exodus, had this relationship with God, talked to, Moses spoke with God as one talks with a friend. And, and at one point, Moses tells God in his prayer, show me your glory. And God says, well, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm going to answer your prayer, but you can't see my full glory because if you did, you would die. And so if you remember, God put Moses in the kind of the cleft of the rock and went by, and Moses was able to see God's kind of backside, in, in essence, God's glory from, from the backside. But the challenge for us and what's different for us than from Moses is that we see Jesus as God in flesh. Jesus is the full embodiment of God. Jesus uh, is fully God and fully divine. And so uh, there, there used to be a song uh, back in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, a worship song, uh, that, that the chorus said, I want to see you, I want to see you. And talking about you know, this longing to see God's presence. And the truth of the matter is, is when we see Jesus, we see God. Because Jesus is God. Jesus is God in flesh. And so if God is the God of truth, then Jesus is the truth of God. And because Jesus is the truth, Jesus embodies this full revelation. And so when we discover, fully discover God and what life with God looks like, if we want to do that, we have to do it through the lens of Jesus, through a relationship with Jesus. And this is what it means that Jesus is the truth. And Jesus says that this is his mission in our passage today in John 18. He says, I was born into the world to testify to truth. And so when we see Jesus, what we are encountering is the truth of God, who God is. And so especially this week, this holy week, when we, when we come and we celebrate Jesus being raised up as king and elevated by the people, uh, you know, riding in on a donkey, and, and there's all sorts of scriptures that we could go back to on a normal Palm Sunday uh, on why, why Jesus did that. But then to, to die on the cross, to be raised from the dead, it is the truth that God loves you and me. That Jesus took on my sin and my shame. That Jesus seeks to, God seeks to restore my life and redeem my life through Jesus. And so when I embrace the truth of who Jesus is, then I can live in that truth, redeemed and restored by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And the hope that we have that Jesus rose from the dead. And so finally, the application of this comes here. That if we call ourselves disciples of Jesus, if we call ourselves followers of Jesus and have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, who is the truth, who is God's truth, then disciples of Jesus must be seekers and speakers of truth. This has to become vitally important for us as believers and as the church especially in a day and an age where we see whether it's on social media or on the news or, or wherever we are finding information throughout the world, that as believers that we are convinced that God is truth and that we will seek to be on the side of truth. Uh, th there's a podcast, uh, a, a, a sermon, I was trying to think of the speaker's name, uh, out at Urbana a couple years ago, a big missions conference out in Illinois. And, and the speaker said, she said, that I am on the side of truth no matter who speaks it, or I seek to be on the side of truth no matter who speaks it and where it comes from because God is, God is truth. And so as disciples then, we should pursue the truth of who God is with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we pursue the truth of God, we will begin to live out the truth of who God is in our world. And this is so important to us because we do live in a world where truth is dying, where truth is being challenged, where we live with my truth and your truth and, and anyone else's truth, and that we've lost a sense of that there is a truth that is found through Jesus, uh, that is found in God through Jesus Christ. It's important for us on a, on a very practical level then when it comes down to what we post and what we uh, put on things like social media or, or the ways in which we talk to one another, that we seek to be people of truth in the midst of that. I, I heard a, a, in regards to this passage and thinking about truth, someone talk about rules for Christians as we post on social media. Uh, the primary rule would be don't, but you know, we, we all still do. Uh, none of us really do follow that rule, or most of us don't. Some of you still do. Good for you. <laughs> uh, but, but the first thing to ask ourselves before we post or share anything on social media should be, is it true? Is it true? Have we verified it? Is it true? The second thing should be, is it helpful? Is what we're posting helpful? Does it hurt anybody by posting this? And the other one, is it necessary that we post what we post? 
And, and so, and this is so important because if we want to talk about the truth of God, then people should see that we are being truthful through what we post, through what we say, through our interactions. We have to seek the truth, but also speak the truth because ultimately what we want to do is speak about our relationship with God. And if we're spouting falsehoods from somewhere else, then why should anyone believe us when we come to speak about God? We should be seekers and speakers of truth. Truth is important. You know, as we think about this and we think about social issues and our personal relationships, we should seek to live out the truth of God, going a little deeper than social media here. We should seek the truth in our lives so that we can live out the truth of God in our lives and in our relationships with one another. That the deeper we go in our relationship, and this is why it's first in our vision statement that we want to grow believers who, who grow deep in their relationship with God, because the deeper we go in our relationship with God, the deeper we are able to interact with the people around us. The, the deeper our wisdom is, and I think we can all say that wisdom is a quality that is lacking in our culture, in our society today, that if we choose to go deeper in our understanding of who God is in God's truth, we can live in God's wisdom, and therefore we can act with God's wisdom in our community and in our relationships. Truth is important. And so when we encounter the truth of God, when we study the scriptures and understand the word of God, when we pray and we listen to the Holy Spirit's leading in our voice, it guides us in God's truth so that we can relate to one another, both in the church and outside of the church, through the lens of God's truth, the truth of who God is, the truth that God has made us as, as beloved creatures, that we all have intrinsic sacred value and sacred worth that changes how we relate to one another. When we grasp that truth, that changes the way we deal uh, with that coworker or with, with that relative, that they too have sacred value and sacred worth. That Jesus came not just to save me, not just to save my church, uh, but Jesus died on the cross to save the entire world. And so the entire world, all the people in it are worthy of uh, that Jesus came to save them. Then we as a church and as individuals should seek to reach out to the people around us. We should see the world through God's eyes and see the value in God's love around us, for us, in the world. I think we need to hear Pilate's question and consider the choice that Pilate had here. Because here, Pilate has this one-on-one -on -one interview. They're away from the Jewish leaders. There's probably a couple soldiers around, but Jesus is, you know, who knows, in handcuffs or something, shackled. Uh, he, he, he is no threat. In fact, he tells Pilate flat out, I'm, I'm a no threat. You know, he said, if I was a king, my followers would rise up and rebel and they would come and rescue me. Uh, he said, I'm no threat to you. And when Pilate says, what is truth? The irony that you and I know through the lens of the gospel is that Jesus is truth standing right there in front of him. If you read through those the, the words of Jesus in there. It is as if Jesus is offering Pilate the chance to accept the truth of who he is in that moment. And Pilate turns and walks away. You and I have the same choice today, throughout Holy Week, each and every day that we are confronted with the truth of who Jesus is, that Jesus is the Son of God, died on the cross, buried for three days, rose from the dead to forgive us of our sins and to give us hope of resurrection, we can become face-to-face -face with that truth and we have a choice to make. Will we accept the truth of who Jesus is and its implications on my life? Or will we turn and walk away as Pilate did? later washing his hands of it, trying to absolve himself from his role? Will we accept the truth or will we walk away from truth? And so we have that choice to make. And the truth is that the truth of God is Jesus, our Savior and Messiah, that Jesus is the Passover lamb slain for the forgiveness of the world for your sins and mine that Jesus paid it all for my sin, that Jesus paid it all for your sin. But we have to embrace that truth to live in that freedom. Let's pray together.